Good morning once again. The Lord be with you. Thank you so much. This morning, our gospel lesson can be found. The gospel according to St. Luke chapter 2. And we will read and hear together verses 41 through 52. Luke 2, 41 through 52. If you'd like to follow along, you can find this on New Testament page 55 in your pew Bible. Again, it's Luke chapter 2, verses 41 through 52. And here is what it says. Now every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up as usual for the festival. When the festival was ended and they started to return, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents did not know it. Assuming that he was in the group of travelers, they went a day's journey. Then they started to look for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. After three days, they found him in the temple sitting among the teachers, listening to them, and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Child, why have you treated us like this? Look, your father and I have been searching for you in great anxiety. He said to them, Why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he said to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. His mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in years and in divine and human favor. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I suppose one of the most frequently asked questions that I've encountered since finishing my seminary education just over four years ago is whether or not I miss being in school. And I think people ask me that because it seems like a good portion of my life has been devoted to academics in some form or fashion. I started kindergarten before I was five, and I graduated from Vanderbilt a month after turning 31. And in that span of roughly 27 years, there were only a couple that I wasn't enrolled in classes somewhere. But do I miss it? That's the question. Uh, I do I do miss it, but but not all of it. Speaking of my most recent scholastic experience, I I don't miss multiple trips weekly to and from Nashville for three and a half years. I don't miss that. Uh, I, I don't miss the stacks of books that had to be read for my classes, nor do I miss the 10, 20, even 30 page papers that I had to compose seemingly every time I blinked. But what I miss perhaps least of all is having to divide my time between pursuit of that degree and other places and other people that needed my attention just as much. All of that being said, what is left to miss? (laughs) Well, in reality, I, I do deeply miss that seminary afforded me a very unique opportunity for growth, a very unique opportunity for growth. Intellectual growth, of course, but, but a distinct spiritual growth as well. In other words, I, I value my time in seminary because I believed it helped me to mature in my understanding of and in, in my relationship with God. You know that pursuit of, of any scholastic achievement requires Lots of lectures and reading and writing, lots of study, lots of exams. And there was all of the above at Bandy. What you may not know is that in the Divinity School, at least, space was intentionally made for all students 
to draw close to God through worship and through the building of community. And I think this is what meant so very much to me. I'll tell you a story. Each Friday in Benton Chapel, there was a small group of students that met for worship. Now, typically we didn't sing, uh, nor was there a sermon as such. But our little assembly would come together to offer thanks and to lift up concerns and to pray for one another. But most importantly, most importantly, what we did, we always gathered at the Lord's table. We always broke bread and we always shared the cup. Now, usually these services, again, they were once a week, only lasted about 12 to 15 minutes. But it was in the sacrament. It was it was in those moments together where we shared together. It was in that time, in that place, that I found the deepest meaning during my seminary career. Not because I had no opportunities to receive the Eucharist anywhere else, but because in that environment, so normatively given to hustle and bustle and chaos and worry and concern, it allowed me to be still. It allowed me to pause. It permitted me to stop, even if it was just for a few moments, and refocus my attention on what it was I was really doing there in the first place and why I was putting so much effort into my studies. Because after all, it was not ultimately to please a, a committee or a board or a district superintendent or even a bishop. The reason I was there in the first place was to grow. To deepen my sense of, of God's hand on and in my life. And to be better equipped to respond to God's call on my life. Growth. It's what it was all about. And it's basic biology, you know. Living things grow, don't they? Seeds become trees. Puppies become dogs. But in order to grow, they need to be properly nourished. Plants, animals, human beings, of all the living elements of creation, this fundamental precept holds true. If we are alive, we must grow. And our growth is dependent on nourishment, on being nourished. Consider, if you will, our gospel text for this morning. The narrative is, is one of the better known stories in Scripture, even though St. Luke is the only one who records it. Nonetheless, we, we are fast forwarded from Jerusalem, or from Bethlehem to Jerusalem, excuse me, from a manger to the temple. And the boy Jesus, all of 12 years old, is with Mary and Joseph as they travel to the holy city to celebrate the Passover. Back in those days, the festivities lasted for about seven days and featured prayer and, and the reading of Scripture and the offering of sacrifices. It, it was a way of commemorating the ancient Israelites' liberation from Egyptian captivity. And I don't know, but I have to imagine that Jesus and his folks would have had a grand old time during these celebrations. But we're told that on the way home, Jesus gets separated from his parents. Now, to be frank, I've, I've always been a little bit bothered by their rather blasé initial response. They travel for an entire day before even realizing that he's gone. They travel for an entire day before showing any sort of real concern. Right? And you thought Kevin McAllister's parents were bad. All this, that's a Home Alone reference in case you didn't get it. All the same, they are noticeably relieved when they finally do find Jesus in the temple of all places and they chastise him for wandering off. Jesus, however, responds that, <laughs> duh, of course I'm going to be in my father's house. Where else would I have been? This perplexes his parents. 
But the last image we have is of them leaving Jerusalem together. And still it's the final thing that Luke says. The very last thing that Luke says that I want all of us to hear this morning. He tells us that Jesus increased in wisdom and in years and in divine and human favor. Jesus did. Jesus increased in wisdom. He increased in divine favor. Now, we've surely heard these words before, but have we ever really paused to contemplate these words? This is Jesus, whom Christian tradition portrays as as perfect, as sinless, as the Son of God, indeed the Word of God incarnate, a main focus of this Christmas season. But this same Jesus has room, at least according to Luke, to grow. This same Jesus, according to the Gospel author, increases in wisdom, in knowledge, in insight, in understanding. This same Jesus increases in divine favor. He grows closer to God. He matures spiritually. I suppose what I want to know is, if there were room for even Jesus to grow, how is it that we sometimes seem to think that there isn't room for us to do the same? Do we really think that we're as good as we're going to get or that God has accomplished everything in us that can be accomplished? Why do we appear so contented with where we are in our faith or so lax in nourishing our spirits? Why do we assume that the whole of the Christian experience is contained in a single discreet moment wherein we ask Jesus into our hearts? No, My friends, no. Faith is a living entity. It moves. And it shifts. And it changes. It's not the same day today. And salvation is a process. One which begins with God calling out to us. And our response to that call. But it continues for the rest of our days as we strive toward holiness of heart and of life. And just as our bodies, which are living things, need proper sustenance in order to remain healthy, so our spirits, which, by the way, are also living, wither if malnourished. I submit to you that's why Jesus stayed behind. Maybe he was seeking growth. Notice, read the text closely. Jesus is in the pupil's position. He's sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking questions. But he's not disrupting them. He's not disputing them or their words. He's displaying an eagerness to learn, to be shaped, to converse. He's developing his understanding of God. And this becomes all the more evident when one looks at the ancient tongues. You see, we sometimes render Jesus' words as, I must be in my Father's house. Other translations say something like, I must be about my Father's business. But the Greek, it's funny, says nothing about houses. It says nothing about business. What Jesus does say, at least in the ancient tongues, is that I need to be in my Father's presence. That's the literal translation of what Jesus says. I need to be close to God. I need to be with God. And so Jesus sets for us the bar. Jesus sets for us the example. It's in being with God, spending time with God, that we grow, that we are formed. That we increase in wisdom and in holiness. And it's kind of funny because an almost identical story is told about Samuel. We heard it this morning. 
When the prophet was a boy, it says that he ministered before the Lord. Literally, he lived in the tabernacle. It'd be like if somebody set up a a cot in the back of the church building. He stayed there. He stayed, lived in the place where God was considered to dwell such that his parents only saw him once a year. He spent time near to God, studying the things of God, doing the work of God. And he didn't get it right all the time. But Samuel too is said to have grown in stature and in favor with the Lord and with people. Again, I say, if there was room for Samuel to grow, if there was room for Jesus himself to grow, shouldn't there be room for us to do the same? Shouldn't there be room for us to learn more about who God is and what God desires for and from our lives. Shouldn't there be room for us to get closer to God? To approach with with greater depth what God is calling us to do or, or who God is calling us to be. I personally believe that there is plenty of room for each of us to grow. And by the way, so did John Wesley. He said that though a man were pure, Even though a man were pure as Christ was pure, still he would have room to increase in holiness and in the love of God. Even if somebody was pure. Those are Wesley's words. Now speaking for myself, I don't think that I would be placed by any stretch of the imagination into the category labeled pure. And so all the more reason for me to grow. I think that most of us should be able to say something similar. And again, I believe we come to this growth in the same way that Samuel did, in the same way that Jesus did. We spend time with God. We nourish our spirits by by feeding them good things, which allow them for a few moments to step away, to step out of the world's chaos as we center our thoughts, our hearts on God. Our tradition and others have usually referred to these things as as means of grace. Acts which call our attention to the ways in which God is, is moving in our lives and in the lives of others. These things might be individual works of piety such as prayer or, or fasting or searching the scriptures. Now, I know that many of us pray daily. I trust that most of us pray daily. But when was the last time outside of a medical mandate that we fasted? I don't like to fast. I'm not a fan of fasting. In mind, we need to think of fasting only as abstaining from food or from drink. We can fast from anything that might be an impediment or or a barrier to our spiritual growth. Any habit or any practice that takes up too much of our time or, or too much of our attention. Moreover, how much do we study God's Word? I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. But how much do we actually spend time in the study and the searching of God's Word? Do we open our Bibles if it's not a Sunday? Or if it's not a Wednesday? If we believe that this book from which we read every Sunday morning is the sufficient rule both of faith and of practice and contains all things necessary for salvation, then why do we not delve more deeply into the truths that we say it contains? St. Paul says we ought to let the word of Christ dwell in us richly. Can we say that it does? And still, the means of grace might take other shapes. They might be corporate works of piety, such as Christian conferencing, or gathering for worship, or receiving the sacraments. In each of these, we spend time with others who are also seeking to follow the Christ, thus building not only our relationships with God, but but strengthening our relationships with our sisters 
and with our brothers, which strengthens the body to do kingdom work. And yet, as we well know, these means of grace are sometimes denied as well. Do we join with our fellows in worship at every opportunity? Or is it reserved only for convenient times? Do we expect that we will be attendant to and participatory in worship, singing, as the Apostle says, with gratitude in our hearts, or do we come as we feel like it, or if we've nothing better to do? Hmm. Is anyone offended? And the sacraments, do we value the gift of baptism? Do we value the holy mystery? of the table? Do we see them as conveying grace, as affecting inward change? Or are they just more empty rituals that are observed out of a sense of duty or obedience or obligation? I believe God speaks to us profoundly through the water, through the bread, and through the cup. There's much that these holy mysteries have to say. There's much that they accomplish as we listen and as we give them ourselves to them. But I believe God also speaks through individual and communal works of mercy, such as giving to the poor. Were you listening to the words of the anthem this morning? Giving to the poor, visiting the sick and imprisoned, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, seeking social justice through working to reform corrupt structures. These means of grace help us to remember that just as God has lovingly given God's self to us, so we are to give ourselves in love to others. Some of the absolutely most spiritually formative experiences that I have had have come out of opening a hand to someone in need or, or sitting for just a few moments with someone who's hurting. I'm not trying to toot my own horn, but what I am wondering is, do we look, do we look, do we search out, do we seek opportunities to do such things? I think we need to. I think we should. Because God is present in those moments in extraordinarily profound ways. So what it all comes down to is this. Jesus stays behind, worrying his earthly parents half to death. But he does so, so he can be in his heavenly parents' house. It's so he can be in the divine presence, in his Father's presence. It's so he can draw closer to God, so he can learn, so he can grow. Like Samuel. The boy Jesus took the time, he made the time to cultivate his relationship with God. And it's something that he continued intentionally with great diligence for the duration of his life. So may we therefore follow his example. May we recognize where in our own lives we have room to grow. And receive with gladness every opportunity that we are given to nourish our spirits, to increase, even as did our Lord, in wisdom and in divine favor. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.